it was in that moment that I kind of recognised that this young person, music is actually more important to them than it is to me. So how can it be that my classroom is a space which they aren't comfortable? Welcome to Inspiring Voices, the podcast of the Sing Up Foundation. We believe in harnessing the power of singing to improve mental health and well-being for children and young people. I'm Baz Chapman, and in this first series, I'll be speaking with inspirational singers, music leaders, researchers, and other specialists to consider the unique role of singing, songwriting, voice exploration, and creative music making in transforming young people's mental health and well-being. Inspiring Voices, a new podcast from the Sing Up Foundation. Please remember to subscribe and leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. And we're just starting to plan season two. So get in touch with your ideas for future topics or interviews you'd like to hear. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. And now on with the show. My guest is Benjamin Turner, creative manager, award-winning educator and community and youth arts leader, whose career has taken him from secondary school music teacher to founder and director of Rap Club. Ben, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> what is it, and I'm asking all of my guests this, what is it about the use of the, the voice or singing or rapping that can be of such value for children and young people's mental health and well-being? From my experience, the use of voice as a form of expression um, is is something which is both in terms of the capacity for a young person to be able to just express emotions or feelings that they otherwise wouldn't be able to express through just speaking about it, doing it through music, that provides a platform for them to be able to feel comfortable. Um, but particularly with the young people that I support, um, music um, and culture in general is such a vital part of their lives and uh, a way that they not only communicate, but a way that they think that it really is in many ways the only way where they can feel comfortable and safe to express. And what's the relationship or maybe even difference between existing music so stuff that they like to listen to for example mm -hmm. or something that you might introduce to them as a teacher and something that they create themselves oh that's a big question um for for a young person who is engaging with music i think for, first of all it's, it's worth um reminding ourselves as educators um that young people are engaging with music a significant amount of the time um, for us to have the perspective that we are the ones who are providing them with this gift of music, this gift of culture, is is wrong. Um, and instead, we I, I feel it's our responsibility to, yes, expose them to other sounds, but also encourage them and support them to explore the sounds and the cultures that they are interested in. And therefore, for me, them creating their own music based off their experiences, both musical and personal, that is where really exciting creation and self-expression as well as self-understanding uh, can come from. And is that something that, that all young people have the capacity to do? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, not, I've not come across any young person who has not been able to use music um, or just culture, arts in general, as a form of expressing themselves. It's going to look different, it's gonna feel different. And, you know, if you put certain um, guidelines in place of this is good quality, this is bad quality, then of course, um, you know, those are very subjective perspectives. Um, as soon as you remove that and just look at it in terms of, is this young person expressing, are they creating? Um, then yes, if they're giving a space where they feel safe to do it, then absolutely every every young person not only is able to use arts to express, but really needs it as a form of expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a really interesting uh, observation in in a time when education is under so much pressure, isn't it? To to mm -hmm. look at things which perhaps aren't so much about creativity and self expression. Yes, yeah, um, I feel that the 
I mean, there, there, there's so many aspects of the curriculum in schools which is more geared towards the perspectives and values of the teacher or the perspective and values of whoever's designed the curriculum rather than actually what is it that that young person would benefit from, um, whether that be from a creative perspective, whether that be from an understanding the creative industry that they want to go into. Um, and I feel that those are aspects where as soon as we can find ways to not only embrace them, but actually make them central to how our young people develop, that is where really exciting, not just professional career development comes from, but also creative expression and, and again, helping young people to find themselves, understand themselves and the world that they live in and the cultures that they engage with and, and don't engage with. Yeah, and we're going to come back a bit more into the, the world of Rap Club. Let's just go back a bit. Uh, maybe just tell me if you can, uh, uh, what are your memories of, of singing and music making when you were younger? Yes. Um, I mean, when, when I was younger, I was... Um, I, I So my main instrument was... Well, first instrument was piano. Um, then I ended up learning um, saxophone. Um, I also did quite a bit of singing in school groups. Um, and I was, you know, leading my own band at um, secondary school. Um, so I, I had a very rich and varied um, music, uh, ch musical childhood. But as much as it was varied, it was it was very much from a from a quite Western classical lens. So, for example, it was in choirs which reflected more the the music of. Western classical, it was me playing in an orchestra, me playing, um, you know, Beethoven, Bach, etc., on the piano. Um, and th there was immense value in that for me. Um, but what, um, what really drew me to music in particular at first was jazz, because I was able to, you know, create and express more rather than what I felt, I think, at the time a bit like I, I was just kind of replicating other people's things. I wanted to see what I could I could create. And then how did that relate to your decision to become a teacher? <laughs> My decision to, I didn't really make a decision to become a teacher. Um, I think I had, I had some warped perspective of having this creative lifestyle. And then <laughs> my, um, my mum then kind of reminded me that not earning any money wasn't really a sustainable lifestyle. And so it was her <laughs> recommendation that I go into teaching. Um, and she, so she showed me, uh, what was it, Teach First, um, and was like, right, why don't you go into teaching? Um, that way you can move to London and, you know, you might be able to do music more there. Um, I think really she was just trying to get me a, a paid job. She didn't, she wasn't thinking about, oh, you go to London, you can do music. I think it was just get a paid, sustainable, secure career. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, why I became, that's why I became a teacher. I didn't go in in any way with some kind of pull towards, oh, I want to work with young people, or I want to share my music. It was very much just from a practical perspective. And ultimately, you know, my mum can be quite scary when she wants me to do something. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at that point, you probably just didn't know whether you were going to have that kind of connection with young people. No. Um, it, so it... it was music in a way the 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 thing that kind of helped you to do that rather than um maybe a, a subject that that isn't perhaps quite so interactive yeah i i mean for me my upbringing i'd, I'd grown up in the either in yorkshire or in the midlands um and then i ended up being put into a school in south croydon um which was culturally extremely different to to me um and yet in terms of um how i looked it looked a lot more like me so it was a very surreal experience of going from spaces which were predominantly white to then spaces which were predominantly black at least when it came to the um, learners not so much in terms of the staff body um and so culturally i was i was very different to the young people but it was interesting how for them, them looking at me, there was almost an assumption that I, I, I would understand them a bit more. Um, but it wasn't until music became the vehicle for that kind of exchange 
that like kind of a true connection I think really formed and my my own kind of self perceptions of myself and of music shifted based off those conversations and experiences with them leading um leading the music and introducing me to different music so the the curriculum that you were teaching there in Croydon uh was how, how much was that working for the young people that you were teaching I think it would be unfair for me to say it wasn't working. Um, there were some young people who it was who it did suit, um, specifically those who had access to instrumental tuition outside of school. Um, so, for example, there was a, a couple of students who played violin, um, one who played piano. Those students, it suited them. It was it reflected the repertoire that they were doing, but also culturally they were. They were, they had an interest in that music already, uh, whether that be because of what they'd been exposed to before or not. Um, obviously, I, I don't know exactly where it came from, um, but for the vast majority, um, music was the thing that they loved outside of the classroom, but the thing that they hated as soon as they walked in. Um, it just didn't reflect them. It didn't reflect what they wanted to do, and for many of them, they would they would be very open in saying how this isn't music, this is just paper and pens. This isn't the music that I want to do or that I'm interested in. So was there a particular time or moment where that changed? Was there there's something that, that, that gave you that opportunity with those young people to look at this in a different way? I had been teaching for... I think it was it was probably within the first month. Um, and as you can imagine, with the curriculum not really reflecting the interests of some of the young people in the class, um, there was friction. And I ended up doing what, what I think probably every single teacher does. I set a detention. Um, and uh, it was with a year nine pupil who, who was, I felt quite purposefully trying to disrupt the lesson. Um, and for the detention, um, I ended up hosting it in my classroom after school. And at first they came in very angry and frustrated that they had a detention from the relaxed, cool teacher, um, which was which was simply based off how I looked rather than actually anything about me. Um, and so there was a lot of frustration that they came in with. And then I just felt, you know, what's, what's the point of me just making them sit in silence? So I asked them, what kind of music do you actually enjoy listening to? Um, and they seemed very shocked by this question. Um, and then they were, they it seemed like they thought I was trying to trap them into something. And then I just gave them my laptop um, and said, look, just play me any music. I don't really, you know, if there's swear words in it or anything, that's, that's fine. I just would like to hear the music that you are interested in. And then they played me for the, so this was the first time I heard UK drill music. And um, I remember at the time being just kind of like, whoa, this is very violent and um, okay, all right. Um, but as much as I was feeling that in, in terms of my initial reaction, um, I really, I remember looking over at the young person and seeing in them this excitement and energy and um sudden sense that they were just they they felt it seemed like they were a very different person they went from being closed off to sudden just open even just in how they were holding themselves and that that has always stuck with me because if anything it kind of made me feel i've i've never i've loved music i've enjoyed music a lot music means enough to me that i want a career wanted a career in it and was prepared to teach it etc but i had never quite felt i thought what I could see in that young person. Music didn't, hadn't ever meant quite as much to me as it had for that young person in that moment because of that escape that it provided them, which I had never needed. Um, and so it was in that moment that I kind of recognised that this young person, music is actually more important to them than it is to me. So how can it be that my classroom is a space which they aren't comfortable so walking away from 
from well, almost literally from that that experience what was going through your mind did you start to kind of hatch a plan <laughs> um I, I was definitely not quite as um you know pre-planning as i i feel i am now when it comes to those situations um at the time so what, what happened was obviously they played the music and then i just said you know what um, so they played a few different types of music. Then they played a piece called Stereotype by an artist called Cadet, um, which is talking about different stereotypes that he felt that he was either living up to or not living up to, etc. cetera. Um, and it had some piano in it. And so I thought, okay, fine, I can, I can quickly play that on piano. So I said, right, I'm going to play the piano part for that and you write some lyrics. And then they started writing lyrics where they were talking in an extremely open way about life at home about abuse that they were experiencing etc so my, my first reaction walking away was oh my goodness who do I talk to right now about this um I had not expected to be in just having especially of all, of all people a young person who um the majority of the school seemed to have almost given up on um and instead they're suddenly opening up about all these issues so that was my first priority what do I do who do I speak to um but alongside that it was a sense of how can I have gone from the point of this young person being so angry and frustrated with me to then suddenly being so open to me in a way where they'd never been that open to anyone else in the school? And it was clear that the, the answer was through the music, feeling safe in that space and then being able to express through that. So immediately it was kind of hatching ideas of, okay, this is something that is clearly important for that young person, probably for other young people. And then I remember the next year nine lesson, um, I started the lesson and then three of them just started throwing paper and then <laughs> just throwing paper around the room um, and just like yelling out, making noises every time I talked. And I just said, what is going on? Um, and they said, well, Turner, because they all just call me Turner. They're like, Turner, we... Uh, give us a detention. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and they said, give us a detention. We want to have another, we want, we want to have a rap session like he did. <laughs> so I then gave them the deal that if they worked hard in the lesson that we would do, we would do the same kind of thing, a space for them to just write some bars. Um, Earn your detention. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, but suddenly it was, it was the most well-behaved that I'd ever had them in the lesson. They were quiet, they were doing their work. And then after school, they turned up um they 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 when it got to i think it was five o'clock i said okay i'm, I'm, I'm i want to go home and they were all like no 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 um so it was it, it was interesting because at that point all it was i didn't know anything about rap technique i hadn't looked into it i hadn't tried working out how i can help support them it was just a space for them to be creative but also where i was also where i was present as that kind of older person who's able to guide and support them whenever they had um issues and so yeah from that point it just became it, I tried keeping it to one day a week but it ended up being that they were there every break every lunchtime every after school every minute that anyone was there to give them that space they were they were taking it up and were you finding they were uh, you'd said that 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 first person was opening up to you were, were they happy to express themselves to each other as well as to you when it became a bigger group yeah I I remember thinking is is it going to be the same um and two weeks in uh we did something which i i now call the honesty rap um where i played a similarly mellow piano piece and they were they all were sat in absolute silence for about an hour just writing and then one by one they then took it in turns to start doing their bars and one of them was talking about, um, again, issues at home. One of them was talking about um, their own feelings of self-doubt. Um, and then the one which was most impactful to me was they were talking about how they felt that they were having to fake it for their friends, which included people who were in the room um, uh, in terms of like what personality they were, etc. And it was it was the, the, the silent acknowledgement from each other after everyone shared their bars, which was really powerful because it wasn't a case of okay let me talk to you about what you've just said it was just a case of i see you i i i hear you i see you um and then straight afterwards they're just laughing and joking um so yeah it, it, if anything it, it kind of it kind of set the expectation that this is a space where you not only can 
express your feelings, but where you need to and should be sharing your feelings. Yeah. So that something about, um, well, to quote Eminem, losing yourself in the music <laughs> somehow yeah. gave them that uh, uh, permission to, or some kind of safety to be able to express themselves uh, in a way which kind of, it's almost miraculous, isn't it? You know, mm. a therapist might take months to sort of draw that stuff out. And yet there they are immediately creating some, creating their own avenue to express yeah. themselves. Uh, I mean, that must have been, well, it must have been an emotional experience, but but I suppose a really rewarding one for you. Yeah, I, I remember it. it kind of set me on a path of being both extremely present in those spaces at the same time as being very absent at the same time. Um, it was finding that balance of leading, engaging them, but then also being able to, for them, almost become invisible to the point where they just, they're so safe, they're so secure to just express. Um, what, what's been interesting over the years as well is it used to be that they would only really express through their music um, what it is that they're emotionally going through. And over time, they now it, it, they don't need the music anymore uh, to start that conversation. They just do it straight away. And that to me showed how, just like you were saying, had I tried going in with the just, let's just talk about this problem, uh, perhaps it, it would not have been as quick um, and open conversation um so yeah no it was it was a very powerful moment for me and it yeah it set me on set me on the path of that being what i what i basically do and that that early focus uh was it just that one student who was interested in drill or did you find that 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 was a or or the kind oh, of no, more aggressive were, style of music they right. were all interested in that music all of them um and it, it, it's been interesting again for me because at first, I had no, I, I, I hated it, I'll be honest. I thought it was terrible. Mm. Um, mm. And then over time, I've grown to develop an appreciation and understanding for that music as well as lots of other rap, um, which I think, again, highlights how for a music teacher like myself, there's, I, I fully understand why there will be a perception that rap is, you know, lower quality music, etc. But through having experienced it and then being taught by the young people about why that music has value and why it has so much rich complexity within it. Um, I've really grown to have just as much respect for that as any other genre, if anything, at times even more because of the combination of musicality and lyrics and um, that form of expression. <laughs> How did you deal with the the fact that the subject matter was stuff where perhaps a, a teacher's instinct is to say, I cannot allow that to happen in in my classroom? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of whether I ever really had that perspective. I think for me, it was just how can this, this can't be wrong, whether there's a rule saying students shouldn't be swearing. I mean, this comes down to a lot of perspectives I have around those kind of rules that are set in school where you know if you say no swearing does that mean are you banning it from their lives or are you banning it from the space that you have ownership of if you're saying no violent music are you making them not listen to violent music or are you just saying in this space you don't but in those other spaces you can because the problem there is that we're literally abandoning young people to these things that we think are wrong and them just having to experience them in spaces where we aren't present and where we can't guide and support them. So now to, to me, it was never a case of this is a problem. It was more a case of if this is a problem, then it absolutely has to be something that I'm present for. Yeah. Okay. And, but you mentioned that they, they started to kind of move away from that uh, as almost like a kind of self-managed thing. Is that right? Yeah, it was, again, with the way that the project worked, it was very much like a community. Now, as it as it developed, I recognised that they were looking to me for a, a wide range of things. They were looking at me as a, as a mentor, as a support, but also 
one thing which they really wanted was for me to drive excellence for them. They were looking to me to really push them to be as as strong as they could in that genre. Um, and so I really I really took took that on as a responsibility and um, made it a case where I, I would push them no matter what to continue developing their skills. Even now, when there are young people who are you know signed to Def Jam and who are performing at big concerts, they still turn up to me and they're like, "So what do I need to improve?" Um, so that that became a really key element for me in terms of the excellence. But whilst that was happening, they themselves were almost recognizing that the music that they were writing was music which was more true to them and their circumstances than to the music that they might be listening to, which also isn't necessarily true to the circumstances of the artists who were writing it. Um, they, we kind of developed a set of rules and the first rule is honesty when writing raps, where you can talk about violence, you can talk about all these things as long as they have some kind of truth to your situation, because then you should be expressing it. But if your life is not, you know, a violent life, then outside of certain creative parameters, where of course you, you should, you know, creative freedom is vital. Um, if you're talking about it from the perspective of this is what I do, then that shouldn't really have a place. Yeah. Relate that to, well, this this whole big issue of safety, you know, particularly when it's stuff, creative stuff that is quite deliberately drawing out young people's stories and their, their emotions and, and the way that life is for them. Uh, there's an issue there both of kind of safety for them and things that they might disclose um, or things that they might express in a way which might be inappropriate. Uh, and the safety for you as someone absorbing some probably pretty tough stuff. Um, what was your approach to, to, to dealing with that? My approach to dealing with them expressing um, issues in their lives, first of all, was to look at, you know, what the school processes were. But unfortunately, those processes were ones which, for the most part, would result in that young person feeling that they've said too much or going down a process which would really, you know, potentially harm them. Um, and so what I ended up doing over time was getting training from youth practitioners outside of school, outside of education as to how can those young people be supported. So for example, in alternative provision schools, how do they approach those, those kind of topics? Um, but ultimately, you know, it, it's, it's a good thing that a young person is expressing because if there are serious concerns, then that immediately is present. Um, and it only really becomes a problem when it isn't handled seriously or effectively by the adults in that situation. Um, it's, it's not the responsibility of the young person to not or to say something. They should be saying as much as possible. And then it's our responsibility to handle that effectively. But in terms of, for me... Um, you know, I, I was finding allies in different spaces who I would then talk to about this is what this person has said or this is something. And that was a good way for me to be able to express um, in myself these issues that I was, um, I was well, which were being brought up to me uh, where I was having young people talking about loss was a significant theme. Um, but... Unfortunately, there weren't at the beginning, there weren't very good parameters, uh, very good structures to actually support me in dealing with that. Um, and so I had to, I felt like I was having to take on a lot of that kind of responsibility and a lot of that weight, um, which, yeah, which was very, very difficult uh, because, you know, the subject matter that a lot of them were talking about were, were extremely distressing. Yeah. And uh, I know that you've done work, for example, around um, knife crime and work with gangs and stuff. So it, uh, I guess stuff that's not only uh, personally distressing or traumatic aspects of life, but a link with crime as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think for a lot of teachers, their perspective would be that you know, we need to protect young people from crime and from these things which happen. But that comes from, unfortunately, quite a misunderstanding of what, what is crime and why is crime and where is crime. 
um, in these specific instances. Uh, once you understand what happens in these spaces and what, you know, what are the priorities of the young people and what, how they engage with their community, then you can start to understand the context of it and then actually be able to, you know, approach that in a more effective way. Um, because I think with, with a lot of young people in the areas that I work in, um, there are, there are, they're surrounded by so many risks um, and so many different cultural perspectives that going in with perceptions that I was bringing at the beginning of my teaching career would have just resulted in a, in a clash. Um, so yeah, it was, it's, it's a difficult one when it comes to that. And, um, but it's, it's, you know, important, I think, again, for the leader, for the adult, the teacher to be able to step back and not bring their personal perspectives in. Hmm. Um, you'd mentioned about, um, uh, young people coming to you for, for, for your expertise and, and that, that quality and, and developing excellence was really important to you. Just tell me about your own musical development, having not been kind of particularly a rapper by background. Uh, how did you, how did you get to that point of, of being able to develop them, uh, as, you know, lyric writers, as musicians? Yeah, I, I learned a lot from them, essentially. It was a case of what do they value? Hmm. And then how can I then push them to develop that further? So for example, where they were looking at, um, they wanted to be able to rap fast, essentially. Then it was like, okay, what skills can they use to develop rapping fast um, in terms of their enunciation, in terms of ensuring that there's clarity in, in their delivery, as well as um, you know various vocal techniques that they can then apply, which no one would, typically be like, oh, as a rapper, you need to do this thing, but actually has significant benefit for them there. Um, whether it be in terms of per performance delivery, whether it's lyrics, all the different aspects which I could see them identifying, whether consciously or subconsciously as being, this is going to be making a better quality rap. That was where I went to. I think it would have been ineffective for me to look online how to do good rap, because at the end of the day, you know, the person writing that isn't the young people who are trying to develop. And if I can get from my young people what they value and what they want to develop, then that's going to be the most effective approach. And, um, you know, the, the, the successes of the young people there in terms of how they've managed to get all these different performances and career development, um, it's, it's been because they've set the guidelines for what they want to improve really and how does that meet with a a national curriculum expectation were you were you kind of almost like playing games to try and kind of make what they were achieving fit what the curriculum was asking from you or did you just say actually this is you know this is more important we're just going to do this um i never really felt that the national curriculum was a barrier um i feel like it if you if you look at it from certain perspectives um or just as a verbatim this is exactly this if it says this music or this art this genre etc then it has to mean that as long as you if you can look at it from a more open perspective then there it, it it suits and you can you can make it work it's it's that kind of exposing young people to a range of music that doesn't have to mean the music which the teacher perceives to be a range of music. Um, it's like I, I, how I had that perspective of I've been exposed to so much different music growing up, um, none of which was um, rap music, none of which was really, you know, Afrobeat, none of it. No, there was so many music which I had no familiarity with. And I feel like I've learned probably the similar amount of different musics within just the past six, seven years of exposure to the musics and cultures of the young people that I work with, that I would have had a perspective of, if it says range of music, it means this. Whereas now I would be saying, oh, I was missing out on so many things that I that I was barely scratching the surface there. Mm. Um, we'll, we'll move on in a second, but, but, but what would you say had been the 
the wider impact of that work within the school and maybe the sort of the legacy that you left behind? Yeah, so that school, well, all, all the schools that I've kind of worked in, there's been that kind of moment of, oh, there's this rap club group. Um, and it's, be, it's been fascinating to see the consistent response from the student body where those young people have almost become, you know, pillars of the <laughs> community within their schools, which has been really interesting in terms of talking to them about what what does that responsibility then mean for them. But um, yeah, in each of the schools, they, they've ended up doing really exciting performances, but the main impact has been on other students as well as obviously themselves, where their perception of what they can achieve in a creative um, industry perspective is much, much larger than they might have perceived before. But I think on a more personal level, it's, it's that they feel that their culture, it may not always still be safe in their schools, um, but it is something which deserves to be in their school. Um, and that's, that's been a legacy which I've been very proud of in, in the young people. How, how diverse have the participants been? Is it, is it, have you found it to be perceived as a, as a non-white form of music? No, um, it's, it's always been very open. We've had people from all sorts of backgrounds, both ethnic, uh, ethnicity, um, class background, even, um, you know, mu music is music is music. There is no, there is no barrier, um, to it so it's us, us constructing barriers is pointless however um there is a difference between those young people who it benefits the most on a personal level and who who it doesn't to quite the same extent and again there's not a particular um demographic that i'd point to there it's more those who need to express because they don't get to express in other ways that is the young person who has been drawn most to it. Um, so we've we've had girls. Um, in fact, there was a, there was a, a white girl who was using rap to really express their um, insecurities around um, how people were looking at them or perceiving them. Um, those were things which they felt that they needed this vehicle to be able to express. Um, in the same way that a, a black boy would be talking about. Um, how he felt um, that he had to maintain a certain image. Yeah. And isn't that the, uh, the amazing thing about music, that it, it can span things like, you know, learning about harmony uh, right through to, you know, facing up to trauma from your early life. Mm. And uh, the, the more we, you know, the more we explore this and the science behind it, the more amazing things it tells us about about the role of, the voice uh, in, yeah. in helping us to deal with and communicate who we are. Absolutely. And, and I think um, it's also, you look at young people and what, what, what is it they're, they're listening to? So when, for example, they're listening to a rapper talk about certain experiences that they've gone through and how therapeutic just listening to the music is. Um, and that also highlights why there is such a career potential in well, any music, but especially that music, because it's not just from a marketing business side. It's also people need to hear this music for themselves, especially if they're not able to create it themselves. And so that's what's led to these young people having so much potential for careers because there is such a need for others to hear their expression. Yeah. All right. So let's let's go from uh, this work within schools to to the rise of Rap Club and what it is now. He's got a little brother, a little sister that he has to take care of. And he drops into school, says I'm gonna miss ya and I love you. Don't let them put no one above you. See, that's kind of mad cause he has no one, but he wants to do God, he wants to show them that there's more to life than what he's chosen. That there's more to life than what he's chosen. This is London. Young boys wanna know how to function, but they don't know how. Oh wow, always looking to the road, but it's sunken. Guys wanna know what this is London. Young boys wanna know how to function, but they don't know how. Oh wow, always looking to the road. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, 
with Rap Club, it's, as, as I said right at the beginning, it was always just community first. And it was very, very much led by them with me being the facilitator who, yes, I was, I was pushing them to have the high expectations. But ultimately, it was a case of they want to do this thing. How can I make that become a reality? Um, it, it was, it's been fascinating seeing that safe space. It's been fascinating seeing young people who outside of that room are perceived to be either behavioural issues or um, diff difficult in whatever way, um, suddenly become incredible leaders, uh, managers of of others, even if they're not on a like looking to use creative expression, having other ways to be part of the community, and that's really what's kind of grown it. Now we have the the Spit Game platform, which is our most exposed community, where we have so many young people all over London who've taken part in it. We've got this spit on the street element where young people just turn up and just rap bars. And again, people just turning up who we've never met before, suddenly having an opportunity to share their expression and sometimes talk about really brutal realities that they have with complete strangers literally on the street, um, and which is then filmed and then put on YouTube, etc. Um, it's It's been fascinating seeing that community grow. And also, you know, now it's not just music. We're now doing film. We're, we're doing a feature film at the moment. We've had um, other short films. So it's just it's just a creative community at the end of the day. But it is one where there have been, you know, many times where there's been misconceptions around what that community is, what it's what it stands for, um, and most of that comes down to a mis misunderstanding of the culture, as well as imposing perceptions on what is good music or what is a what is what should a good learner look like um which is ignoring um cultural perceptions that the person saying that would have and how do you how do you respond to that you know it, I, I guess it could be quite easy to get sort of dragged down into uh dealing with individuals who who are you know raising a complaint or, or, or objecting um I suppose, how do you advocate for the work it's it's been very difficult at times um there have been instances where people are so confused about why the these young people um ha are wanting to spend so much time um in a music room with mr turner and there have been, you know, some um, assumptions around, oh, they must be doing nefarious activities up there. Otherwise, why would they be there? Um, where it's been with people who are simply not in a position to, you know, put up roadblocks, um, the best response has always been for us, we just prove the positive impact of what we do. We just continue as a community and we just show them, look, here's some positive music that we've done, but we also don't shy away from any aspect of the culture. Um, and it's it's more where there have been people in positions of authority where that's been much more difficult because it can't just be ignored. Um, and in those instances, sometimes discussion and exposure to what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it has been effective. Um, and in other instances, it's been a case where... Um, there's just been a significant cultural, I'd say, barrier um, where they have lacked that openness to really embrace what it is that this approach and this music means to those young people. Um, hopefully there are going to be people uh, watching or listening to this podcast who think, I really want to do something with this. I, I could really see that happening in my setting. What would be some of your uh, most important tips for someone wanting to develop this work? Yeah, the the, for the the main thing is young people in the in the curriculum in the spaces that they are wanting to be in. The thing which will make them feel safe isn't that they're color is reflected is is that their culture is reflected it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter what, what your background is as long as you are providing a safe open space for young people you can be that leader that facilitator um there have been people who i've supported to run their own rap clubs who come from 
e- like much further back, um, different backgrounds than even I was to the young people that I work with and who've been really successful with that. Um, so first of all, it doesn't matter who you are, you can absolutely do it. And then the main principle being letting the young people lead because if you let them lead first and foremost, then you can guide following their lead. But if you're letting them lead, then the enthusiasm and energy that they have is right there from the beginning. And you can let them lead from a creative perspective, but also from the perspective of what career do they want? And then, right, what do I need to find to be able to support that? I think there's so many young people who want careers in the creative industries and who could have careers in the creative industries, but it's often the teacher who isn't aware of what those things are. And all it takes is, you know, sometimes a Google search and, oh, there there are all these roles. Um, so ultimately, yeah, letting the young people take the lead and tr- trusting them, ultimately, trusting them to take the lead. Right right now, we've got in the company, um, two alumni are directors of the company um, because it just doesn't make sense for anyone other than them to be in those positions. It's it's trusting them to lead. And you would be, I, I am consistently surprised by how much they can continually do pushing to the next level and then the next level yeah um i'd like to uh, ask you before we finish about um a particularly inspiring vocal moment uh from any time really does anything really jump out for you um yeah the I mean, again, with all of this, there's been so many vocal moments. There, there was, for example, the time that um, a young person who'd, who'd lost their parents then performed a rap about that um, in a public concert. And um, it was it was extremely powerful. But um, to me, a, a vocal moment, which has been quite a key memory that I keep coming back to, is when I was teaching in a school in Camden, um, and we had the rap club, but there was I couldn't I couldn't have everyone who wanted to be in it in that group. Um, and so then I had the choir, um, and this was a mixed school. Um, I think slightly more female students than male. Um, but by the end of that first term in the winter concert, we had an eighty-person choir. Um, Seventy-five of them were male, um, <laughs> which was a very odd experience, but they were all singing their hearts out and just really going for it. Um, and it, it wasn't that they were singing rap music. It was that they, I, I guess that the rap club had provided that kind of sense of this is a space which is safe. So it's okay to just express regardless of what that expression is and what music or sound is. Um, and I still have memories of that concert with that massive choir and everyone just belting um, it wasn't the, it wasn't the most beautiful sound. I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm definitely not the, a, a great choir leader, but um, yeah, no, that that's a that's a great memory for me. Oh, well, that's a great way to finish, and uh, and I guess uh, the the best way to to show the the value of of what you've achieved here is the the films that are on the Rap Club website, which mm-hmm. where the young people express for themselves don't they just that that sense of community the sense of safety it's just like it's like a checklist of everything you could ever want those young people yeah. to uh, to be able to get to uh, and that's all happened through uh, through this approach of you know understanding your own abilities and authenticity and and harnessing this extraordinary power and passion that young people have um, and the amazing things it can do so yeah thank you for uh, for all those inspirational insights into your story um, and <laughs> all the best me. with the rest of it. Thank you, Ben. Cheers. Thanks. This is Inspiring Voices, the podcast of the Sing Up Foundation. Join us for the rest of the series on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts and other major platforms. You can also watch the video of each episode on the Sing Up Foundation YouTube channel. Inspiring Voices, a new podcast from the Sing Up Foundation. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe and leave us a review on Apple or Spotify.
Season one of Inspiring Voices was funded as part of the cultural recovery funding that SingUp and the SingUp Foundation received. Thanks to Arts Council England for their support.